Welcome, everyone, to episode number 63 on our NCAA social series. Very special guest here, NCAA president, Mark Emmer. I'm Andy Katz. Well, Mark, this has been a momentous week in college athletics for the NCAA at all three divisions. NIL, we've been talking about it for years. Uh, there's been multiple hearings in front of Congress. There's been multiple meetings with the Board of Governors at all levels of all divisions on this topic. Uh, we knew five states were gonna enact laws beginning July 1st, so there was time for action. So let's first deal with your reaction to the news that NIL now is basically here for the foreseeable future. Well, first of all, it's good to be with you, of course, again. Uh, but the the impact of this for student athletes, I think, is incredibly positive. We we saw a circumstance where we're going to have hugely disparate rules around the country, with opportunities provided to a very limited set of students, and that didn't make any sense. So, working with the boards, we we're able to craft a temporary solution that allows all student athletes now to monetize their name, image, and likeness starting July 1. And, and that's uh, that's exciting. It's a, it's a new day for students. And I think it's going to be something that they'll really be able to take advantage of. So obviously, in a perfect world, there would have been traditional legislation, maybe congressional action. Um, what did it take to get this done, obviously, in a short period of time to make sure that there were not sort of two sets of rules for those in five states and soon to be maybe 17 states? and then the rest of the country. Yeah, well, first of all, it, this whole process was a demonstration we don't live in a perfect world. <laughs> so as you said at the top, we've been working on this for a couple of years. It was clear back in August of, uh, or the fall, I guess, of 19, where the Board of Governors uh, asked the, uh, the three divisions to craft uh, permanent NIL rule changes. Uh, all three divisions put together working groups of of uh, coaches, student athletes, uh, athletic directors, conference commissioners, faculty reps uh, to sit down and, and work through what could be the, the approaches that each of the three divisions wanted to take. Uh, we got to a place, as you know, last January, where we were hopeful that we'd be able to put all of those permanent rules in place. We had uh, uh, intervention by the Justice Department at that stage that we needed to get clarified. And, and by the time we were at that place, we'd also been working with Congress for a good while, hoping Congress would be able to put in place a single national rule, which is what we of course, still need. Uh, but at the end of the day, those things couldn't transpire as quickly as we want. So we then had to back up and say, okay, look, we've got to allow all students to have a fair shot at this. Uh, we got, again, all three divisions together, worked through some preliminary language, uh, got it in front of them, and, and after a lot of discussion, debate, wrangling, we wound up with what is the, uh, the, the next best option, which is some clarity about what can happen for all students to give everybody a chance to, to uh, engage in NIL activity. And so it was, it was hard. It literally went to the 11th hour, uh, but we got it done. So let's deal with clarity because we want to make sure there is no misinformation um, about what a student athlete can do regardless of sport and, you know, who they can essentially contract with uh, and whether or not their school can be involved or even their school logo. Um, so if we could maybe just educate some people about, you know, sort of in the short term, what can a student athlete do with their name, image and likeness as it relates to their university? Yeah, I think first of all, a, a, a little bit of context is important. So, so this does not, in fact, change the rules around pay for play. It doesn't change the rules around improper inducements for a student to go to or attend one school. Uh, doesn't create those kinds of changes at all. What it what it does do is it says that a student athlete can work with an independent third party, a, a um, a, a contract sponsor, uh, anyone like that, that they want to work with, uh, not to receive direct payments from the university. Schools cannot pay someone directly. They still cannot pay them for their performance on the field. Even the third party can't do that, but they can engage in these third, these third party arrangements. Uh, the, the rules about using school marks and a variety of other issues are complicated and confused because some states say absolutely yes, some states say absolutely no. 
So where the boards wound up, our three boards, is they wound up saying, look, first and foremost, we're not going to interfere with your state law. We're not going to put a student athlete, stick them between our rules and state rules. So we said the state rules uh, get get uh, the, the the nod here. You, you have to make sure that you know what the rules are at the school that you're going to attend. So if you're going to school in one state, you need to make sure talking with the athletic department, you know what those state rules are. The states are going to provide, uh, excuse me, the school provide that kind of advice. If you're in a state that doesn't have a, a, a state law, then what we're saying is, you can do whatever you want in this space as long as it's not pay for play, as long as it's not money coming from the school, as long as it's not an inducement to go to or remain at uh, any one individual school. So it's very broad based um, uh, guidelines. That's frustrating to a lot of people, but given the confusion between all these different states, given the lack of a federal single policy, and given the, the legal environment right now, we're we're going to have to uh, define this a little bit more as we go along. So we're we're disappointed that we couldn't give as much clarity as we'd like, but we're confident that we can provide the benefit of the doubt to the students so that they can move forward in this space. All right. So let's deal with what's next. Uh, this sort of like sounds like there's two parallel tracks here. There's congressional legislation, and then there's potential for a universal NCAA legislation. Help me out here in terms of where we are on both of those tracks. Yeah, so uh, we have to continue working with Congress. Uh, there's been, especially on the Senate side, a lot of debate and discussion, as you pointed out, uh, a number of hearings. I think we've had five Senate hearings now on NIL issues. Uh, they're continuing to work with us. We've been very engaged with them. There's a, an understanding of the complexity of the issues. It's just hard to get you know, support for things these days in Congress. We all know that. Over on the House side, it's even a little more complex, but the goal right now is to try and get something through through the Senate side and then and then move it over to the House. And I, I'm very hopeful and optimistic that'll occur, but it's not gonna happen in the next week or two or three, and we all know that. So that was why we had to adopt uh, these temporary rules. At the same time, as we see the experience playing out in, in the various states, we're going to have all the members continue to track on what's working and what's not working and make adjustments as we need and as the legal landscape allows to provide greater clarity and, and better uh, guardrails around what fits and what doesn't fit and what supports a collegiate model of sport. So the membership will keep working on uh, more permanent rules. We'll do that in concert with Congress and hopefully we can get them to come together sometime in the very near future. So if you know, sort of chicken and egg. Um, what has to come first? Uh, because if there's NCA legislation uh, and then suddenly there's congressional, which we have no idea when that's going to happen. Um, and that's just, you know, I don't care what legislation it is. You can never predict when that's going to be agreed upon. So how, how do you work with not knowing what happens in DC versus the need for some form of a permanent policy? Yeah, the policy that we just put in place, as, as you probably are aware, says that this is in place until one of those two things occurs. Uh, I, I, I know what the presidents on our boards want and what I've been working toward is to, to get as clear a sense from Congress as we can about when we can expect some action on the, uh, from, from them on their behalf. Uh, if that looks like it's going to get pushed way out into the future, then we will have to re-engage on a permanent rule. Uh, we'd much rather have a Congress act. We want to work with them to get their action in place. But if that looks like that's going to take too long or maybe not occur at all, then we're going to have to go in and, and craft our own permanent rules using the ones that are in place right now as the skeletal framework. The other challenge, of course, is states are continuing to come online with their own state laws and there'll be new ones introduced. And, and that makes this much more challenging. That's why we really, really still need Congress to act. Even though we're, we're in a place where students can, uh, can monetize NIL, that's great, all, all in favor of it, but we still need to have some consistency across all of the states and a whole range of questions around this. Yeah, so the flexibility of the of a potential permanent NCAA legislation, uh, how do you deal with that, as you pointed out, if you don't want it to supersede and probably can't legally state or let alone if we ever get to federal. 
Yeah, well, we're going to continue to, first of all, uh, enforce the, the policies that are in place around pay for play, around improper inducements, so that when there is a, if, if there becomes a circumstance where it's clear that a, a school or you know, one of their entities is directly engaged in compensating a student athlete for, for their participation in sport, you know, we're still gonna say, no, 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 you cannot be doing that. And, and we need to make sure that that stays in place and that states understand if they pass a law in that space, that'll be very difficult for, for the student athletes in that state and, and for college sports in general. Similarly, if there's recruitment inducements, whether it's for someone coming into college or whether it's someone transferring out or even staying at a school, we're gonna have to make sure that we can enforce those rules and states have to know that those are the broad boundaries. Inside that, there's a lot of latitude and we've been trying very hard to make sure everybody understands there's latitude there. Um, most all of the schools are fine with behaviors that are in between those two, but those two things have got to remain the bedrock of what it means to be a, a collegiate athlete. So, so Mark, just as a general comment here, uh, just before we wrap up, um, this feels like really since the pandemic started, whether it was obviously what was happening in a social justice space or um, as this was progressing, it feels like 2020 and now into 2021 and beyond is sort of the year of the student athlete empowerment. You know, the ability and in the encouragement to raise your voice, speak your mind, the ability to transfer without, you know, a penalty on a one-time transfer, which has now been adopted. And now NIL, um, there's definitely a shift of that empowerment to allow student athletes uh, to feel like they have certainly more of a say and, um, you know, the ability to sort of um, do more what they want within their collegiate experience under that giant umbrella. What are your thoughts on what really has transpired over the last year and a half? I think you're describing it pretty well. I, I would um, really stay, say that it's a continuation, a continuum that's been going on for nearly a decade now as we've looked at what we can and should be doing to support student athletes and been, you know, improving that their circumstances, their support levels, their opportunities, restrictions on, on uh, how much time coaches can demand of them, et cetera. We've been layering that on again and again and again. And, and this is in some ways a culmination of that effort. And, and the empowerment, as you describe it, of student athletes to be engaged with their voices and, and involvement, both socially and, and also around NCA rules, I think is a terrific exemplar of what it means to be a college student. That's, you know, those are the things that we want students to do. We want them to be engaged in those issues. And, and, and this has got us to this point. And I think in, in, in total, it's a very, very good thing. Uh, confusing, for sure. A lot of things to clarify. Absolutely. Will there be bumps in the road? No doubt about it. But are we in a better space than we were uh, a few days ago? Yeah, for sure. You know, and one last thing, Mark, that um, what we've already seen in the first 24 to 48 hours of this is this is one of the first things that I, and I, you know, I've been doing this for 30 plus years, where I sense all levels of divisions and all sports, male, female, uh, regardless, are taking advantage of this. Uh, that this is not just a football, men's basketball kind of thing here, where gymnastics and women's volleyball and you name it, the, the opportunity is there, especially with social media, uh, to take advantage of this opportunity. How much are you seeing that this could really be, uh, as we move forward, something that college students at all levels, all sports fully embrace, which in a weird way may actually want them to stay and enjoy the collegiate experience even more. Well, I think that's the most exciting aspect of this is that it, it's impossible for us to predict, especially you know uh, older folk, where students are gonna go with this because they're so creative and energetic and entrepreneurial in all space. Uh, it's, it's gonna be fun and exciting. And, and obviously a star athlete in a big high profile program at a, in a sport that's uh, got, got a lot of attention to it has in a certain extent a leg up. But I was chatting with a young man who 
who was uh, playing his sport in Division One, a good athlete, but he decided he wanted to move to a D3 school. And a significant reason he wanted to do that is so he'd have more time to do his social media stuff, which he really loved and was really excited about. And the demands on him as a D1 player were making it harder to do that. So he said, you know, I'd really like to have more time and opportunity. It was just this interesting little vignette of, of how people are thinking about this. And, and it, you know, you can be a, a, a fencer, you can be a gymnast, you can be whatever the sport is. If you can take advantage of these kinds of opportunities to project yourself out into the world, that's going to be really exciting to watch. Moreover, I want to make sure that schools are helping students to develop the skills and knowledge to do this because that's going to be a very important lifelong skill for today's student athletes for the rest of their lives. They're going to have to engage, whether it's for work or their personal lives or their entrepreneurial interests in this kind of an environment. So it, it winds up having a really nice academic overlay on it too that, that I'm very, very excited about. And I will just say this uh, as a quick postscript that this is a great example that whether you are a coach who suddenly you know, has to adapt to his player, to his personnel, regardless of sport, you wanna survive, you have to adapt. You can't just hold on to the only way that you coach and that's the only way that you're gonna do things. You have to adapt, you have to allow your players obviously to do social media and all those kinds of things if you wanna survive and advance in your particular profession. That's the same thing that's happening here and no one should be shocked that ultimately you have to adapt, move on, things change in society. And this is a great example of this. Um, no, that's exactly so we're gonna have more conversations on this going forward. A lot of things are still changing uh, over the course of the next couple of months. But as we head into the summer, the last championship has been crowned in the College World Series with Mississippi State in baseball. And now we move in to a whole new era for student athletes uh, beginning here in the month of July. Uh, Mark, I appreciate all your time. As always, uh, this will wrap up this edition of our NCAA Social Series. As always, you can go to ncaa.org slash social series, where all of them are archived over the last year and a half. We'll talk to you next week, everyone. Stay safe.